Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for taking the time to come to the panel discussion about using um, alternative textbooks. My name is Adrian Ho, Director of Digital Scholarship at UK Libraries, and uh, this week is Open Education Week, so happy Open Education Week. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining us today for the panel. Um, UK Libraries has actually started promoting the use of alternative textbooks in uh, 2016. And by alternative textbooks, we actually refer to three different types of uh, three different types of materials, um, including open educational resources, um, free online content, and also electronic resources licensed by the library. So, to encourage uh, UK instructors to adopt um, alternative textbooks, the library has started um, the first round of um, the alternative textbook grant program in 2016. And then um, we have just finished the third round. Um, so based on the recommendations from the University Senate Library Committee, we have selected 10 winning proposals. And um, so this is the list of the um, instructors who will receive a grant of $1,500 each uh, because, they, um, because of their winning proposals. And then um, in the past two years, uh, you know, we have um, awarded uh, the grants to different um, instructors. And then uh, some of their feedback was that um, you know, even though you know, they are eager to teach with alternative textbooks, they wondered how other people, other instructors do that. So that's why now today we have um, this panel discussion. Um, it is an occasion for, you, so for we all to get together and talk about how um, you know, how to use alternative textbooks for teaching and learning. Um, and then I, I would like to introduce our panelists and the, and the moderator. So first, um, we have um, Dr. Brenna Bird. So um, Dr. Bird is an assistant professor of German in the Modern and Classical Languages, Literatures and Cultures Department at UK and the Southern Conference on Language Teaching 2017 Teacher of the Year. She received her PhD in uh, Germanic Lang uh, Linguistics from UCLA and has been working at UK since then as Director of Beginning German. She oversees the curriculum and training of instructors for the first three semesters of German. Her, in uh, her uh, research interests include sociolinguistics, hip-hop studies, and computer-mediated communication, among others. And then um, another panelist, um, she is Dr. Melody Denny. So Dr. Denny is a lecturer in the Department of Biology at UK. Previously, she was a lecturer at California State University. Uh, Melody received her PhD from um, West Virginia University. Her current teaching responsibilities include two biology courses. Additionally, she currently mentors six undergraduate students in research. Melody also has an interest in evaluating techniques to evaluate to effectively train graduate students how to teach undergraduate students scientific writing skills. And then the third panelist is uh, Dr. Stephanie Reynolds. Um, Dr. Reynolds is, has been at UK uh, as a faculty member at um, the School of Information Science for 11 years. She holds a PhD in Interdisciplinary Science from the University of North Texas. Um, Dr. Reynolds specializes in literature and library services for youth teaching courses in children's literature, young adult literature, and youth literature for a diverse society, as well as information in society and collection development. And last but not least, uh, we have um, Trey Connetzer as our moderator. So some of you uh, probably know Trey. So Trey works at, uh, at the Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching. Um, he supports faculty across uh, the disciplines to engage students in active and collaborative learning to re-emerging uh, course and program curricula and outcomes, and to integrate digital technologies and pedagogies in, uh, in meaningful ways for student learning. He is also an instructor at different campus units. He is currently teaching a digital humanities course that uses only openly available scholarly texts and educational resources. So now I'll hand the mic to Trey, and you'll take it away. I already have the mic, so. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. We're so glad to see all of you here to 
uh, hear about these experiences integrating open resources and to get your questions and uh, maybe even your experiences too for the Q&A. So the format uh, hopefully will be as informal as possible. Uh, feel free to you know, ask questions and raise your hand to especially follow up on something that our panelists say. And uh, if I'm, for some reason, as I want to do, perhaps looking in a different place in the room and I don't see you waving your hand emphatically, just maybe vocalize your desire for my attention and I'll direct it elsewhere. Uh, so we have uh, some questions I've prepared and we'll go through our panelists to get their experiences and have a QA and a and discussion at, uh, towards the end of the session. So to start out, um, we want to start as any good story uh, starts with the beginning, right? This story is beginning, middle, and end. And uh, this question is in the category of taking the leap. And so for all three of our panelists here, and this is a way of introducing the course or the courses that you have used open resources for. Um, but what uh, influenced your decision to adopt open resources, to pursue different options for resources um, beyond the uh, cost savings benefit, though that also, of course, factors in? So that's the question about taking the leap. I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, Everybody's okay. looking at me, so I guess okay. I'll start first. All right, so I'm Melody, I'm from biology, and I guess I kind of fumbled into it. It wasn't something I was specifically looking for, um, but I teach second semester majors biology, and with that, we have a huge textbook, traditional textbook. It's over $200 new, plus we were starting to use clickers and online learning platforms in addition to that, so it was well over $300 per student per semester. Um, so. We were revitalizing our program, especially the introductory biology classes. And in doing that, we were struggling with the textbook we were using. It wasn't a good fit. Um, we were jumping all over and, and um, the content, there was a lot of extra content students were getting lost in. And so um, to start, I poll students a lot using the clickers. and so. Um, I pulled students and I said, okay, how many of you guys are using the textbook? And, and I gave them a, a, you know, a typical Likert scale, so never all the way up to religiously every day. And of the students um, that responded, so there was almost 200 students that responded, and of those, only 2% said they used the textbook all the time. Of the responses, 78% of them said, we don't use the textbook at all, or we rarely use it. So to me, that was a huge waste of money, but it also, another thing that was happening is on the TCE, students were complaining that the textbook was really overwhelming to them, and they didn't want to use it. And so that was kind of our motivating factor for trying to find something new. <clears throat> okay, um, I think I'll, I'll talk mainly about the German um, the switch from the German textbook. Um, similarly, we had a textbook that was very, very expensive. It was about $300. Uh, and I found out uh, that the, uh, the textbook publisher was increasing the cost by $15 every semester without telling me. And uh, so a price that I had agreed upon three years prior then kept getting higher and higher. Um, our textbook came with uh, two online workbooks that the students had to pay $30 each for, so that's one of the reasons that it was so expensive. And um, we found out, one, the students were cheating with the online, they were just copying and pasting. Um, they would, they would, there was, a, there was a, a glitch a lot of the instructors didn't know that you, if you sh let the students see their answers, then they could just open up another browser and get all of the the correct answers copy and pasted, so we started seeing people finish their homework in two seconds. <laughs> so they would just not fill anything out, it's class submit, and it would, um, and then, but the big reason, I mean the cost definitely, but the big reason um, for the switch for me and um, also my colleague Julie Human in French, um, was that, so I teach a course where I train a new graduate student instructors in language pedagogy. And I started to feel very hypocritical because I was telling our students what were best practices for teaching, for assessment, um, what kinds of activities we should be doing in the classroom, we should be 
focusing on authentic materials, real-world context, and our textbook was extremely outdated. Um, even though it said that it was in this method, uh, it, it was um, it had lots of not real-world use, uh, very uh, meaningless exercises. That uh, one example is uh, you had to list all of the electric, um, all of the appliances in your house that use electricity. I don't know the last time I've told someone all of the appliances in my house that use electricity. Uh, and some of them were really uh, old fashioned. Um, so I, I found the textbook very outdated even though it came out with a new edition every year uh, that you had to then buy. Uh, and then also the online, um, I've worked, I have a background in digital humanities also. I worked for two years at the Center for Digital Humanities at UCLA. And um, so I did a lot of work on the other side of designing online language courses and online courses. We did a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, IT support for professors in, in all kinds of um, fields. And so I had a background already in what's good online design. And then I saw these textbooks that our students were paying $30 for. And they were basically taking an old school written text book and moving it online. There was no no um, thought into how online design might be different than paper design. And that actually frustrated me a lot. And so, yeah, I, I, I cut ties with McGraw-Hill. Uh, it's like three years, four years now, four years. Um, and uh, moved to a completely online uh, textbook, um, and as has French. Um, both German and French have moved to a completely online textbook. So that's, that's where we started. <laughs> Like Melody, um, I sort of stumbled into this. Uh, I wasn't really planning on looking for open access resources um, for my course. Um, I actually teach seven different online courses, but the grant that I did was intended for the children's literature course. Um, and I feel a little silly now complaining about this being $110 after hearing about $300 textbooks. But, uh, that was my you know, initial primary concern, was uh, trying to help the undergraduates, and I also teach the graduate version of this same course, to um, be able to save a little money. Um, we also use a roughly $25 mass market um, book as well, um, but being children's literature, they're also reading a lot of children's literature throughout the semester. Uh, it's you know, close to 70 books. Now they're not expected to buy those. I'm a librarian, I teach future librarians, and so we're always encouraged, encouraging them to come use the course reserves over here, as well as to access Lexington Public Library and the surrounding libraries. Um, so we ended up with um, an open access textbook, and we really didn't have any choice. It wasn't like you know there were 10 to pick from. There was one, and so, the downside with that was that I elected it, I adopted it, if you will, um, before actually being able to see it, the book in its entirety. And one of the things I liked about it that you won't get from something like this is that the text is interactive. So there were videos embedded. Uh, students can access the book as an iBook or they can download the PDF and have the have the URLs for the videos, but if they're using the iBook version, it's all embedded. So it's much more interactive and more engaging for students, but it also lacks quite a bit. So we are actually in the process of deciding whether to continue with that or use it in part. And at least for my graduate course, the plan is to go back to this, but I will um, save some of that for, for future questions. So the theme of today, as the title says, how did they do that, right? So the topic of the next question is sort of along the lines of how did you do that in terms of finding the right resources? So for various reasons, the decision was made or stumbled into to adopt different materials for the courses. And I think with a lot of us, and myself included, once you decide that you want to look elsewhere, um, one can feel stuck in that initial stages of trying to figure out where to find these resources, maybe feeling a little bit limited in choices, right? So how did you identify 
the best ways to locate the right resources that were of uh, quality for what you wanted? And uh, did you use particular strategies to find these resources, or did you end up using particular strategies that other faculty might find helpful? And how did you make sure that these resources that you found were aligned with your goals for the class? Well, as, as I mentioned, I elected to use a book before I had seen it in its entirety and not something that I will, that I will do again. Um, and I probably, you know, if it hadn't been for the grant, for the grant would not even have gone down the path of looking for open access materials. And for my undergraduate class, it's very different than what I do in my graduate course, but I've tried to keep the textbooks consistent. Consistent going forward, uh, if I were not to use a textbook, I would probably look for more journal articles um, for supporting the materials in the graduate course, much more so than I would do in the undergraduate course. Um, so again, as though as I mentioned, um, we really only have the one option, and it is um, out of a. Um, it's a grant-funded publication out of the University, I think, of South Florida. And um, our, it was our library liaison who actually found the title. So I didn't have to go searching for anything. I didn't spend you know, hours perusing, whereas when I've looked at alternative textbooks, this is the ninth edition of this one, and we've been using it probably since at least the third or fourth edition. When I've looked at alternatives, I spend hours, I read them, I spend hours perusing them, and that just didn't happen in this case. We have continued to use it because the book does, the open access book does have a lot of merit to it. It just lacks the depth of this, and so that's why we're considering moving forward in a different way in the future. Um, so, uh I started looking at different textbooks first, different print textbooks, and um, I have like 50 different ones in my office, and I, uh, I, kept, I kept not finding anything that I liked, um, and what I did first actually was um, I worked with my graduate students to develop our own materials for the third, so we have a, a I'm, I usually oversee the first three sequences. Now I'm kind of overseeing the first four semesters in our sequence. Not first three sequences, the first three semesters, now the four um, in our language sequence. And so we started with the, the, the third semester. I started. Um, I worked with the graduate students, and I said, "Okay, let's let's think about this. What would you want to teach about?" Um, and so we came up with small. Uh, small units that we incorporated slowly into while we were still using the print textbook. Um, so the first one was a, a graduate student was really interested in film, and she really liked this one film, and she said, "I would love to teach this film." Uh, and I said, "Okay, let's let's work on it." So she started working on these. Uh, she developed um, as a as an assignment in another course. She developed a, a didacticized uh, unit. And so I said, "All right, you want to teach it? Let's go." So we, she started introducing it, and um, she really enjoyed that. And I found that my, my graduate student instructors got very excited when they were able to teach material that they had developed themselves. And so that also brought in um, more excitement to the classroom. So I started incorporating more materials. Um, and they would just be short. They would be like a two weeks. But that the graduate student was in, was in charge of finding materials, that coming to me, making them into lessons, figuring out what they wanted to do with it. And because it was something interesting and they, they enjoyed it, they would, they would do it. And so we started putting together a bunch of materials that we would use. Um, and then I, was just, I just thought, well, this is a lot of work. And it didn't always work for somebody else to teach with this person's material because this other person doesn't like film. So we started looking at other things and I started asking around. And um, I found out from French, actually, that, uh, that they used the grammar online for this French textbook. And so we talked about, would it be interesting if we did the full textbook from this, these online courses? I couldn't find anybody else who was using the textbook, even at UT Austin, which developed both of the, both the French and the um, German textbook. They weren't using the German textbook. Um, and so I just kind of started playing around with it. I would bring in a lesson from it and an activity and see what would happen. 
um, I would I would bring in uh, and again starting in the, the, the a higher level where things were a little bit more flexible bringing in a little bit and then the next semester we bring a little bit more in and so it, it kind of it, it was a very it was a slow every semester we did a little bit and I think that's something that um, I always hear from colleagues when you're thinking about changes don't try and reinvent the wheel don't do everything all at once do small gradual changes that you can you can feel comfortable with um, and so that's what we did we did very from the the first semester I've been here we've been making small changes so it's been um, it's been uh, eight years uh, in the making and um, we've been slowly slowly moving away from uh, we actually moved all the way away from textbook and then that was just them students want the textbook so it's like okay we have to do the online textbook um, but yeah it's, it's still a, a process and that's yeah that and um, going to conferences uh, I uh, I saw somebody presenting on the Spanish uh, online resources and so I just kept asking around and asking people um, like in CELT or um, in your digital and in, in my digital humanities thing with just talking about well, what is out there what are the options um, and so that was really that's how I stumbled into it I say stumbling a lot really stumbling so I don't know if you guys have noticed this yet but the minute the textbook publishers find out that you're looking for a textbook you will be their best friend and we had all kinds of books coming in and, and donations of various types that they were buying us donuts and coffee and giving us bags with their names on it and stuff. And after all that was said, and we went through the alternate, the different textbooks that were there, we were in the same situation that Brent mentioned, that nothing worked. Everything either had too much content, or it we would end up bouncing all over the book. And even then, there were still areas that there was content missing that we wanted to teach. Um, so you know, we kind of talked, there are, I think five or six of us that are teaching introductory biology and we said well why don't we just try and go without there's so much online content and students are looking up a lot of this stuff anyway so let's just get rid of the textbook altogether so spring 2016 is when we made that decision got rid of the textbook and by fall uh, 2016 I started pulling students in the course the first thing they say is Where's our textbook? Yeah. Why don't we have a textbook? <laughs> and so over a third of the students, the semester we went textbook free, came back and said, we want a textbook. This is not working for us. So then we were back to the drawing board again. Um, so our next step, we knew that none of the textbooks were going to work. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We didn't want to start from scratch. It's a huge amount of work. And so what we started looking for instead was material that we could add to, manipulate, change the way that we wanted to. So some of the large publishers will allow you to customize your book. They'll allow you to cut out chapters and reorganize chapters. But like I had a conversation with the editors for one of the major biology um, textbooks and I said, well, I want more than that. I want more control than that. I want to get rid of this image. I want to get rid of that, that um, paragraph in that chapter and I want this paragraph from that chapter to move to that chapter because it's in the wrong place for us and they won't give you that kind of control with the publishers the copyright uh, content but we actually found content online um, through the already published OpenStax um, and another company that actually we could have that control so it took some time to kind of um, find out what we wanted and find a company that was willing to give us that amount of control that we we would have the flexibility to manipulate the material make it match to what we needed it to do um, and to also not have to start from scratch and not have to um, rewrite a textbook from scratch because that's a huge amount of work and all the extra material that comes with it So before we move on, I do want to assure everyone here that although there's a lot of stumbling being talked about, our panelists are very coordinated. So that's, uh, the next question I want to ask about is uh, something that you have touched on just a little bit in talking about you know, students' responses and desiring a textbook. And so you had to adjust uh, a little bit back you know, in order to meet that desire and that expectation. But this question is, 
uh, on the theme of effects on your teaching. And uh, how has this approach to the resources uh, changed your teaching? Your course design, your curriculum, your pedagogy, um, are there any common places about the way that your class works or what counts as a class that you found yourself reevaluating in the process of using open resources? Well, for us, it was a complete overhaul. Um, as I mentioned, we had been using earlier editions of this book for many years in online courses and we teach roughly five to six online sections of this particular course every year and so it was a complete overhaul to switch to the open access textbook and I've, I've spent probably a month I had to rewrite discussion questions I had to redo assignments um, pretty much you know just the entire course and I also had to find supplementation for areas in which the, the open access textbook was weak uh, so, yeah, it was, it was quite, quite intense for us. It, it's been interesting because I do ask the students for their feedback on the textbooks, and I've even provided supplementation from this particular one, and the, the number one feedback, and I haven't even, a, I have not had to ask this necessarily, they've been very forthcoming with it, is that they find the author of the open access book to be a little biased. And I'm glad that they're willing to note that. I'm glad that they are noticing it. And that brings to the point that I tend to prefer edited books. And this, this particular volume here is edited, whereas the open access one is, is one author. And so it's, it's required a lot more from me in terms of providing supplemental content uh, where that particular book is weak, as well as um, having to address the biases um, of, the, of the author of that book. So that's really been the primary difference is uh, this one is much more neutral, uh, it is much more academic, the open access one um, reads a little cheesy at times. So um, it definitely has a few chapters that have merit, but if I continue using it going forward, I will probably pull content from it, write my own, and go back to this one. Um, well, the, the textbook that we chose, um, also being online, um, I don't feel the guilt when I, when I don't cover a chapter or if I skip over material. I always feel that when I'm <laughs> forcing them to buy a textbook and I don't cover three chapters and I'm like, man, we didn't finish the whole book. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't feel bad when I say, oh, we're not going to do these five pages. We're going to do this, this, and this. And it's given us a lot more freedom to be more creative. Um, I'm doing an experiment right now with our second semester where I have them use Twitter. Um, and so they've been tweeting and so I've been able to bring in um, that kind of content on top of uh, the material that's in the textbook. Um, also, because the the textbook is it's structured in a way that I want. It's structured around um, interviews and videos, um, and so it's it's the everything comes more naturally, and it's also more more it's easier to bring in the stuff that I want. And I I'm not um, it, it doesn't have an artificial structure to it. That's what I think was really important to me because the same thing, I'm like, I don't want to do this here and I don't want to do this. I, I want it to come up when it's natural. And so um, it, it feels a lot more and I can, I can say, okay, we're going to watch these videos and we're going to work with the, these videos and the things that come up to me, like, okay, well, this we need to learn this before we can understand what's going on here. Um, then I can work with that and I can bring it in. Um, so as far as the effect on the teaching in the, in the classroom, I think it it makes, I don't feel hypocritical anymore. <laughs> I don't feel that my TAs feel that anymore. I feel that when I teach them, like, this is how we're supposed to teach, and then they go into the classroom and they're trying to figure out how do I make you know, this into a real life situation and it didn't work. Um, now they, they get it more, they're, they're understanding um, it, it, the, the textbook is in line with our philosophy. It kind of, it goes together. Um, it can be trickier for uh, when you're using something. There's this, this tendency with an established textbook to think that that's the, um, the, 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 the main um, words feel me right now. The, the, um, 
the thing that you're supposed to refer to, like the, the uh, I want to say it in German, <laughs> uh, the book that you should refer to, like it's, it's the, the um, expert, uh, like it's, it's the expert um, opinion. And when you have something online, there's this assumption that people start to get, both teachers and students, that it's not as expert because it doesn't come in nice book form. Um, and so that can be a little bit where students have been a little bit more willing to um, say that they're, well, I don't think we should be learning it this way, or I don't think it should be structured this way, or I don't think we should do this, this. Um, of course, it could be the generation. I don't know, because this is, has been, I do feel like this generation is a little bit more uh, willing to um, comment on everything they don't like. Uh, but I do, um, that has been a little bit interesting. So we've had to spend a little bit more time convincing them that we know what we're doing. Uh, and why, say why we're doing this activity. We're doing this activity because of this. But I promise you, you're going to watch this video, and I know you think that it's too hard for you, but it's actually OK. Um, so that's we're spending a little bit more time talking about pedagogy with the students, um, because also it's different from what they're used to. They're used to the older textbooks that we don't like. Um, they want it to be like that. And I'm, I, so that's been a little bit, we've been kind of doing this dance of, no, actually, this is better for you, I promise. And then they finally come around to, oh, yeah, yeah, actually, it, it was. So. so I guess I interpreted this question a little bit differently. Um, <laughs> so in terms of how going in the direction of OER has affected the, the curriculum and the classes I teach, and then the classes I, I kind of collaborate um, with the other introductory biology instructors, our biggest focus was on finding uh, materials that would help set that foundation for these students that are moving towards uh, more challenging classes and in that we were so busy focusing on getting through the curriculum that's laid out and even even though we were still bouncing around kind of picking and choosing topics the topics were already kind of laid out for us in the textbook form and so by changing over to OER and having this flexibility I think that in itself, that ability to be flexible gave us a new kind of um, ability to see the students and to start paying attention to the students and seeing where their weaknesses were. Not only in our own class, but in the classes they were moving into next. And so in my class, we pay attention, or we're preparing students for going on to molecular biology. Uh, physiology and those kind of um, disciplines or those kind of courses and then the first semester it's genetics diversity and evolution and so by having this flexibility in the textbook and the way that you teach the class you can start paying attention to oh man when students get into animal phys they're really struggling in this area then we can go back and say okay well we're teaching it this way but we can change it because we have complete control and we have complete flexibility. So I think that ability, that flexibility, and that ability to pay attention to the students and ask where the student's struggling mm -hmm. has really been, had the biggest influence on us with changing over to OER. Mm -hmm. I want to add to that. That's actually a good point, because our, the website, a lot of students think of a, of a printed textbook as a linear progression, and so they won't look over in chapter seven for something that they might want to know about in chapter one. But um, online, because everything's clickable and um, things can be separated out, they're more willing to, oh, well, I really want to know about this thing, and so they can kind of maneuver around, which is useful because you know, some students are, I mean, our students are at different levels, and they have different, they have questions about things, and they want to know about this thing. And I, I don't, it's such just something about, the, you know, the internet, um, having all of the options in front of you at once, um, instead of having to flip through the pages that encourages them to look ahead more. And so I, f I find our students are actually looking at other stuff more than they would with a print textbook. And they'll, oh, I really want to know what this grammar is. Wow, I can look for it right here and I don't have to think about it right now or I'm really interested in that. So that's the, the not thinking in a linear fashion has been a, a, a boost, I think. So a contradiction that's emerged out of the conversation here is that, um, I think as Melody said, at the opening, she discovered that something like 70% of students were either rarely or never 
using the textbook. So there's this, uh, I think, concern that all of us share as instructors. We assign books and we worry about how are we going to get students to interact with these books, to do the reading, as we often say. Yet, as our panelists have also said, there's this desire for the textbook. So there's both this uh, apathy towards or uh, rejection of the textbook that's tied to a desire for the textbook as an authority figure, even if the authority figure is not consulted that often or at all. And this is a question of student engagement. It's a very, a very common one. And you're already starting to address these ideas about how students are engaging with the material differently, you know, linear versus nonlinear. But I wanted to put it to the panel, have you seen a difference in student engagement with the material using OERs or alternative texts? Um, is it a positive change in engagement or have you had to strategize differently towards getting your students to engage with alternative texts? Um, I think using the using our online textbook itself did not did not engage them that much differently. I, the content was more engaging, but using it online, because they can also, that's the nice thing about our book, is they can order a $30 print copy if they want one. Um, and so uh, they could um, if they wanted to. I don't think it's the, the online itself, it's just that once we're already online, it's really easy for me to send them somewhere else. And so um, our online uh, textbook has a, a it has links to something called Quizlet, where you can do interactive self-grading quizzes. Um, and so you know, showing them that they could actually make their own online flashcards or something like that. Um, there are a lot of, because it's an online, open online resource, it, uh, there are a lot of links within the text to web pages and web quests and, and go to this website and look at this stuff. And so when we force them to do those activities, they do start getting more engaged because they realize, wow, I can actually go to a German website and I can read some of it. Um, or I hear go and try and purchase, not purchase, but go through the motions of purchasing a train ticket from Munich to Berlin. Um, or um, right now, like I'm, I'm doing with Twitter, I'm trying to get them to go on the things that they're, you know, they're, they're one of the homework assignments from the book was to go take a, one of these magazine quizzes on what kind of a travel type you are in German. And so then I had them then tweet that, like, okay, so what, what would you do? And so the, the, I think it, it can lend itself to that, but I think just because it's open, an open resource doesn't mean specifically that it was more engaging in my experience. I don't know. But. So I guess for us, we've, we've been better able to get rid of the extra that overwhelms the students and just kind of whittle it down to the essential content, but also add in, and we have animation links, but they're very specific, so they're not looking at animations that are 15 minutes long and only touch on five minutes worth of the content that we expect them to know. Um, the ancillary content that's embedded in there is very specific and, and targeted just for what we want them to know. So we're able to get rid of that extra stuff that just overwhelms a lot of students. Um, so I'm, I'm all about polling the students since we use the clickers and so we implemented the OER textbook um, platform in 2017, and at that point it was basically bare bones, some, some of the content pulled out from what was mostly open stacks, but we had the ability to go in and edit anything we wanted in there, remove, add, um, anywhere. And so in spring of 2017, this is when we first rolled it out and used it in our classes, and um, so I asked the students, um, did they think that the pan open, the textbook we were using was valuable? And at that time, 67% said yes, and, and the other third said no. And compared to the 2% that used it all the time, that was a nice improvement. But still at 67%, we'd like to see it even higher than that. So we continued to make um, changes to add in missing content. 
um, to add some practice quiz questions on there and things like that that this platform had the ability to do. Um, so it helped the students all in one place. Um, and in fall, this past fall, a year ago, uh, 2017, we re-polled the same question. Um, and almost 90% of the students said they, were, they thought that that um, was valuable now. So that's a huge change. And it's a positive change that the students, even though we're kind of moving away from the hard textbooks, the students were really getting something out of this. Um, some of the other questions that we've asked are what types of, or what do they find most helpful on this OER platform that we're using? 40% um, of them said they really like the e-text, 13% um, links to animation, another 40% the online practice quizzes that they had direct access to, and then a couple of the other students um, timed in that there were other aspects of it that they appreciated. And then finally, um, one of the last questions, of course, anytime you use an OER textbook, this is a question or a concern that's been brought up in the past, is how do you guarantee the quality of the content? How do you know that it's high, high quality content? It's comparable to something that's been edited, that you're not sticking your foot in the door with something that is, is cheesy, right? It's got unedited content and inaccurate information in it. And so, um, we based ours off of OpenStax, and then we went from there, as that foundation, we went and made modifications. But then we went back to the students and we said, okay, um, do you think this textbook is comparable to a hard, hard yeah. rock textbook? And with that one, um, only 8% said no, we think a hardback is better. And then the remaining students agreed that they, they thought the textbook was comparable, even though it was an online uh, open textbook, that it was, it was comparable and, and valuable to them. Our scenario is a little bit different. As I've mentioned, our, our courses are all online. And so the engagement is something that has to really be worked for. And I have all of our, every week we uh, have a weekly discussion. And the discussions are, the, the questions are not answerable if they haven't read the textbook. Um, that doesn't mean they can't go through necessarily and find a few paragraphs and uh, you know attempt to fake it here and there. But for the most part, I try to just try to write the questions so that they have to have to actually have read the chapter. Um, but because they're engaging with each other, um, you know, it's also very easy for, um, in many instances, probably for them to bounce off of somebody else. Um, but what's really interesting is we start out at the beginning of the semester with the mass market book about reading that I mentioned, and they really engage with that book quite well. Then we switch, um, I think, week six to using the open access book. And then later in the semester, we have copyright clearance and are using two chapters um, from this book. And I did ask them last semester what they preferred and what they liked the most. And they love the, the mass market book about reading, but in terms of the two uh, textbooks, the open access book and, and, and this book, they actually like this, um, and they're not actually they're not actually visually seeing this particular textbook. They're not actually holding it unless they come use it in my office. They are still using um, you know PDF versions of those chapters we were allowed to use. So they're not engaging with the actual book, but I do and find do find their engagement very consistent across all three, um, and yet they prefer the the content of this one. But really probably what's most interesting is during the first five weeks when we are discussing the reading habits, and it's actually a handbook about, about reading aloud, we talk about the impact of digital content and how studies have shown that the brain does not retain digital content as well as it does print content. And, um, and what that means for children, because this in, in this particular class, it's, it's future teachers, future K through 12 teachers that are taking the course. And so we're talking about the impact of digital media. And of course, they could be using the Kindle version or the Nook version of that particular mass market book. Um, and then, so we talk about the impact that um, digital content has on the brain, 
um, and not just in terms of retaining content, but I'm not allowed to read on my iPad at night because it keeps me awake. So we talk about all those issues, and then come week six, and I'm switching them to a book that they either have to read online or print out themselves. So that's been a different and interesting dynamic to, you know, talk to them about how they feel about having a textbook that they have to read online or otherwise print out when we've just talked about the impact of actually doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, as I said, I find them to be in equally engaged regardless of the delivery. And so this might touch on something that you've already mentioned, uh, perhaps maybe for this last question, but um, for all the instructors who are here, uh, other staff members who are here, and you're journey in adopting these resources and continuing to evaluate their effectiveness and your strategies, what would you say has been the biggest challenge that you faced? And it could be an ongoing challenge. And um, what have been your strategies or even missteps in addressing those challenges? So for biology, we kind of dove head first in um, spring of 2017 into rolling out the OER textbook and online platform. And then kind of we found out later through UK that we're actually not allowed to do that right away um, because the platform we were utilizing hadn't been cleared for all UK's hurdles. Um, there were um, clearances that had to be done because this online platform um, was going to be getting information on students, including uh, grades for quizzes that we were going to deploy through the platform. And so there were FERPA um, issues that had to be worked out. And there's also um, accessibility issues that have to be addressed. And um, so UK, um, we had to go both through legal counsel and um, the IT department uh, for the university to start working on these um, hurdles to make sure that this platform that we were using was compliant. And so we're still working on some of those. And uh, in the case of the platform we're using, they were brand new. They were working through, you know, with open stocks, but they were not open stocks. And so they hadn't, they're being brand new, us being one of the first kind of groups to take them on and start utilizing them. Um, they hadn't worked out some of the, say, the accessibility for blind students. How does a blind student get access to this stuff? Um, or someone that doesn't hear, is there um, ADA compliance with this material? And so we're still working on developing those ancillary materials. Now being that we're on our own, um, and that we, as being with the, uh, working with this group, um, they have support people that can help us. Um, but we get to make the call, okay, we need this content and that kind of stuff. So there's been some support, um, but at the same time, moving away from the large hardback textbooks, we don't have the support that Pearson or McGraw-Hill or, or some of these other large textbook companies have at their disposal and have already worked out this kind of stuff. And because they're used throughout multiple departments, they've already gone through all these clearance um, and address these these different legalities in the background. Yes? How do you get clearance for a blind person? So there's this, as I found out, there's this thing called a VPAT agreement, which is, I have to remember what it is. Um, it's a voluntary accessibility. No, okay, that's something else. So it has to be ADA compliant, which means that you have to have the reading back of like this is an image of a lion eating a deer for an image in addition to the reading of the text and that kind of stuff. And most textbooks will do that? As far as I know, the um, major publishers have that ability and have cleared that, have already gone through and have that uh, functionality available. Yeah. Um, and then the VPAD is actually just because there are student records being held on third-party websites, there are security issues that have to be cleared, and, and they're also, they have to voluntarily open up how they're maintaining the student records and that kind of stuff to UK. And so that's what the VPAD is, or is about. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges has just been um, because we, we had to get rid of all of our old lesson plans <laughs> that we had used for years for, for teachers to, uh, to use. And when you're training new teachers, you know, that's, that's, a, that's it's a lot of content for them to get through. And so, um, so I've been working a lot with them. Um, I'm voluntarily co-teaching uh, two sections of our second semester right now just because I need to, tw I need to tweak the, um, the content. I need to figure out what's going to work best. So that's been like, figuring out how to translate the stuff that's the textbook that's online to a classroom um, when your instructors are not as capable. Um, I think that's one thing that large, large um, publishers and textbooks from large publishers have going for them is that they've been tested by a lot of different instructors. Now they may not have been updated in 25 years, but uh, they've had a lot of people using those exercises and so they know that those exercises are easy for an instructor to come in and use without, um, without a lot of background in teaching it. And so, so I, have, I have a lot of graduate students that don't really understand what's hard. Um, they don't understand how to break things down so that they're easy. Um, and they're learning how to do that, and so when you're using an online, um, when you're using something that has not been, uh, has not gone through such rigorous uh, testing, uh, it is a little bit more difficult, and you need more skill with learning how to what we call scaffolding, how to break stuff down so that um, students can understand. So you have something that you do beforehand to to get them warmed up on the vocabulary and then you have something else that gets them on the, the what to anticipate what's coming. So these kinds of activities. So we have to spend a little bit more time on pedagogy um, with my instructors than I might need if I had another textbook. On the other hand though, that makes my instructors really great instructors. Um, and so they have a lot, they have a more thorough training. But yeah, that's been I think our hardest hurdle is that it's, it can be a little bit harder to use for a new instructor. Um, somebody who's who's uh, taught for a long time, you kind of know. Oh yeah, I can use this here and I can use this. But right now we're we're trying to develop. So what what I'm doing is I'm doing a lot of powerpoints um, that the instructors can borrow and use. I'm creating a lot of Canvas uh, um, activities. Um, I'm recording videos and and doing a lot of stuff myself and fleshing that out. I'm adding to the the online resource for my instructors so that they have a little bit more guidance. Well, as I already mentioned, uh, probably the biggest hurdle was just having to redevelop the course um, pretty much from scratch. Not entirely, but having to rewrite discussion questions and, and bring things through assignments. Um, but in terms of the open access resource itself, uh, the biggest hurdle was the accessibility. I don't provide the PDF for the text. I provide the URL for their website. And when you access the website, there are three links there. There is, well, actually, there's quite a few links, but there's the link for the, the PDF for the entire document, then there's a link for the iBook version, and then there, is, uh, there are individual links for every chapter and for the embedded content. And so students would access that page and they had no idea what to do with it. So I had to create a video that you know, showed them that you could, the various options and, and what they could do with those. And so that was, that's really probably the biggest hurdle. Um, you know, they're not just um, going and buying a book and, you know, thinking now what do I do with it? <laughs> sort of looking at an online book and going now what do I do with it? So that was probably the biggest hurdle. We're very good in the time that we have left. If there's some questions, comments, uh, ideas, follow-ups from the audience, we'd be happy to take any of those for any of all of our panelists. All the way back, I think Adrian's going to be the microphone runner. Cool. <laughs> How wonderful. Uh, the one issue that I've struggled with is just reading comprehension skills. I mean, it's one thing for a student to say, I've read this, but then you can discover very quickly that they didn't get it. So I'm just wondering whether there's something in your new method that can help maybe more with that feedback of um, whether they succeeded, I guess, in understanding the reading, not just reading it. 
Um, yeah, I, I can speak to that in a different course that I have. I do um, I, I do some other courses, of course, in English, and uh, they uh, what I've started doing for um, more difficult readings uh, because one of the things that I really want to teach my students is how to read academic articles, and so and I know that's really hard for them. I I tend to come up with questions that ask them for their personal opinion on something. So, okay, here are two, there were two different things presented in the, uh, in the article. Which one did you side with and why? Um, I ask them, I ask them also to apply the theoretical stuff to a practical. Uh, um, so something to personal and practical is, is how I, I to concretize it down. Um, for example, uh, there was something called a, um, a crisis ritual. They were reading about, um, it was a folklore mythology class, and they were reading about crisis rituals. And uh, the text does not define, it defines it, but it's, it's abstract, and it's talking about, well, this thing, when um, they're doing this, this, uh, this it's, it's Old Norse religion, so he's like, this man's looking up, and he sees some ravens, and he's like, ah, oh, Odin's happy, um, and, he, and he throws something onto the ground, and it's like, okay, so this is a crisis ritual. What kind of crisis rituals do you use, or have you seen, um, and I give them one, and so then they have to think about, okay, so what would, and I give them like maybe another example then in class, okay, so you always see in the in horror movies, the Catholics always crossing themselves, right? So that kind of, you know, and so they have to think about, oh, okay, so what do I have? What do I do? Do, you, do, I, do I cross my fingers? Do, um, you know, what kinds of things? So I, I, I find that whenever I ask them, something to relate it back to their own like okay well when have you seen this or in your experience what is another example or which film fits this bill um that i get they get uh, i get a better understand i get a better feeling of did they really understand this and i have i've changed almost all of my lecture lecture uh, classes to always have a reading ahead of time with these kinds of questions um, with the discussion board where the students have to post before they can see the other students um, but then they have one point for going back and commenting thoughtfully on another post and what I have found this to do is I have some students that get the readings and I have some students that just don't but then when they have to go back and comment they get it because they're reading and going oh I really like your interpretation better and then I, before I go in and I teach on this, I've also seen what the thread has, you know, what people have understood. And I say, okay, so there were some really good points brought up online. Let's talk about that. And I don't have to cover the whole thing. I can only cover the things that I know that I've seen already are the most difficult. And I found that this format works for me best for um, both undergraduate and graduate. I've kind of retooled all of my courses so that we all have readings and reading reflections online and I never ask for like give me the you know what does this mean I don't ask for specific points I ask for their opinions on things um, and and to reapply them and I get a lot better and the students really like that so that's that's something that's worked for me mine are actually structured the same way I um, depending on the discussion topic I don't require them to post before they can see what others are posting. I do do that in certain circumstances, but mine are all set up so that they have discussion questions based on the readings that are very personal for them. So they are, you know, definitely reflecting um, and providing their own opinion. And then, in order to have an A for the week in discussion, they actually have to have uh, four responses to others. And so, and that's where I'm primarily doing most of my teaching is my engagement with them there. And so that really kind of forces um, the engagement with the materials. It helps me to see where they're not understanding things. Um, I have uh, an alumni of our uh, program who teaches two sections of the Children's Lit course for us every year. And she wrote me um, last fall, maybe halfway through the semester, and we're communicating all the time, but she wrote me one day and she said, I have one student who I don't think understands that children's literature was written for children. And I was like, that was the first, and you know, how do we address that? And so, you know, 
primarily we, in that kind of scenario, we would do that one-on-one, -on -one, but also what can we do with the discussion? Because if one person isn't getting it, maybe others aren't as well. And so using the discussion boards as an opportunity to um, try to figure out where the where the issues are, what they're not understanding, and integrating that in a way so it doesn't target one individual. So I guess for reading comprehension in biology, um, our use of the online resources has been mainly ancillary, so supplemental to what we're doing in the lecture hall. And in the class, our main focus in terms of understanding is on, um, because of science, is on research. Do they understand where this data comes from and what it means? Can they read a graph? We're working on trying to incorporate more of that into the online resources, but that's a um, future activity. One of the things, and this is a challenge area, because once you get away from the main um, textbooks, you have to ask for permission to use that kind of data and information because usually it's published or you have to generate it yourself. And so there are some situations where we've been able to generate generic data through student labs that are already going on in the upper division classes and utilize that in our introductory class and use that to determine whether or not students are understanding these concepts. So that's been kind of the main way that we test that information or test our students' understanding. Um, but we don't usually use the textbook directly um, for comprehension other than just generic, um, do they know it? And then can they use that information to interpret um, scientific information that we deploy in other ways? What we do want to acknowledge that it is 435, which is about what we had scheduled for the official panel, but we have the room until about 5 or a little bit after, and so uh, it probably would be a good idea at this point to get to more of the kind of mingling so that people can ask some follow-up questions of our panelists and you know, maybe get some advice for their individual circumstances. So does that sound good to you, Adrian, for the next step? So we have you know, the beverages and cookies and stuff in the back, so you can feel free to get those. First, let's, can we get a, a round of applause for our panelists for their contributions to So thank you. And so we can uh, just kind of mingle. <laughs>